So this is uh, the makeup lecture for um, lecture six. Even on the slide it's saying lecture four, it's actually lecture six. Uh, Introduction to Macroeconomic Actors Three: The Government. So what we're looking at really um, in this this course is is a microeconomic description of the firm that we're going to knit together to make a macroeconomic description of the entire economy. So first off, we looked at households as utility maximizers, boundedly rational satisfiers, something in between. We looked at firms as profit maximizers and growth maximizers. We looked at banks and central banks. Um, we particularly looked at monetary policy, but also the balance sheet approach. And then now we're going to look at the government, particularly uh, the constraints that it has and its implementation and its effects on fiscal and monetary policy. So here's the important thing. The government is in se it is a contradiction. And I don't just mean the Irish government here. I'm talking about any government at all. Um, it exists to enhance social welfare. That's true. It's there to basically level the playing field, to um, legislate, to stop people from hurting each other, um, to introduce regulations and rules to make life better, frankly, for people. But it also wants to propagate itself through time. So while it has a public good aspect to it, it is also a private actor. It exists to make itself better, to make its um, constituents better off. It exists to grow uh, like everything else. So it it's a large-scale macroeconomic actor, um, and it also, it's also a, an automatic stabilizer. It stops your income from going to zero when you become unemployed. It's, it, it, you, your income goes down, obviously, but um, the government stops you from, from losing everything. So the government also has the power to affect fluctuations in output and employment. Now, this, this last sentence, the first two, two paragraphs are actually kind of facts, right? The, the, the last one is, is, a, is a belief. It has the power to affect fluctuations in output and employment. Um, the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you believe the Keynes-Minsky view of things, then yeah, it does. Um, if you believe the work of people like Paul Krugman, then yeah, it does. And it's actually a good thing. If you believe the work of people like uh, Friedrich Hayek or um, um, people like uh, Robert Barrow or John Taylor from Stanford, then the government is a bad thing and should get out of the way. So is the government responsible for unemployment in Ireland? Um, in the lecture, about 50 or 60% said, no, actually it's not. It's not responsible for your unemployment. Um, and therefore it's not, it shouldn't be tasked with finding you a job. So I like this series because it shows just how much of a drop in government consumption. So which is, that's just G, the spending on goods and services. How, how, just how, how far it's fallen from 2008. and. Um, as I'm, I'm recording this, the IMF have said that we're now on track to uh, complete our program of adjustment. And it's also um, in the teeth of a huge drop in government, household and firm level consumption. Here you can see the huge drop in government uh, uh, deficit as a percentage of GDP. And the reason for that 2010 figure is basically because we added on another 32 billion um, to our government debt in the form of borrowing to pay off the debts of Anglo-Irish Bank and Irish Nationwide. So here's another statement of belief that I believe anyway. Uh, um, there is no natural tendency for economies to generate full employment. You shouldn't believe um, that the economy will return to any equilibrium on its own. And it certainly won't be an equilibrium that, it, that, that has a job for everybody who wants one. Um, if you want growth and stability, and remember those two things are trade-offs, if you're growing, you're not stable. You can grow at a stable rate, but there's a difference. They require the active participation of governments uh, in the form of fiscal, monetary, and income equality policies. So macroeconomically, when we look, think about a simple macro model, if you look at government spending and government revenue, its spending is on goods and services, investment, capital expenditure, transfer payments, grants, and net interest payments, which is the servicing of the debt. If you look at the other side, the revenue, they get money from income taxes, social insurance, corporate taxes, to a certain degree anyway, consumption taxes like that, tariffs, and then of course, is, of course now we're bringing in property, water, carbon, texting, blinking taxes, everything else. Um, probably if they could tax breathing, they would, because the government needs all the revenue it can get. The government, um, like every other actor, economic actor, has a budget constraint, it's, and its budget constraint essentially says it can only borrow some amount B, which is just G minus T, the difference between uh, government expenditure and taxes, plus R, which is the real interest rate, times D, which is government debt. So that debt level is, a, is an amount. Um, it's, a, it's about 170 billion euros right now. 
And that debt evolves ac to according to the following difference equation, which is that dt, so the debt at time t, the debt at time, t the, the debt in 2011 is just the debt in 2010, plus the amount of you that you issue in bonds, b. So those two things map out a, a, a quite a simple differential system, but there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting dynamics that go along that way. Um, the bottom line for all that is that we finance any deficit either through bond sales or money creation. Given that we can't create money because we don't have our own currency anymore, um, the government has to finance a deficit through bond sales, um, which means it's crucially dependent on the money markets and also on the interest rate. Now, if there's only two periods in the world, then then it has an intertemporal budget constraint. For the two-period uh, case, you can say the G1, so the government expenditure in G1 in period one, so that might be, let's say, 30 billion, plus G2 might be 35 billion, divided by one plus R, where R is the uh, interest rate or the discount rate, is equal to the taxes you make in period one plus the taxes you make in period two. What that essentially tells you is that the present value of spending has to equal the present value of taxation. Um, if you believe this, full, this story you believe in a version of what's called Ricardian equivalence. This is a lovely theory that's been falsified empirically by a load of ugly, nasty facts. You can see as well uh, that the fiscal problem necessitates borrowing. Um, and you can see the difference between revenue as a percentage of GDP, which is that green line, and primary expenditure as a percentage of GDP, which is that red line. You, you, you can see the difference. And you can also see um, after 2010 or so, um, just here, you can actually see where the drop is actually taking place. Most of the drop uh, is taking place on the expenditure side, which is what it's combining to give us the sense of austerity. And as the drop in government expenditure happens, you can see, combined of course with the drops in consumption and investment, and far more in terms of investment actually, you can see it dropping and leveling off as, as real GDP per capita falls and then begins to sort of tip up a little bit again. Now, the biggest thing that the government does, I suppose, in times of recession is stop people from starving. Um, and that's a, that's a big deal. It's a big deal because welfare programs like the Dole and uh, disability payments, etc., they stop complete collapses in consumption and therefore they help to stabilize GDP automatically. Um, Dahls et al. found that the US stabilizers are much weaker than the EU's, which means that they're much more open to cyclical fluctuations in people people's income. Um, so here you can see uh, the EU just has a higher level of income stabilization across the various um, support structures that it has, the Fed tax and social income contribution, state taxes and so forth, and it's particularly in the form of benefits for unemployed people than the US. The US has a much lower level of, of all of that. Um, Keynes in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 1937 essentially responding to a book review of his big book um, by a guy called Jacob Viner he restated his thesis to the general theory of employment. And his idea was really quite simple. Imagine the economy is underemployed at uh, some level of GDP, we'll go say GDP one, which is just here, yeah? So it's, it, it, here I'm using the ASAD model to explain the theory. Keynes probably didn't think in these terms, but it, it's the general idea. The government increases um, its government expenditure to G1, uh, from G1 to G2, so it just, it just basically starts spending money. Um, and that pushes, it could also be a tax cut, obviously, but it pushes GDP to, uh, out to this point here, GDP2. And what happens is the aggregate demand re re returns to its long-run aggregate supply. This notion that fiscal policy, either through increased spending or decreased taxes, can have some effect on the real economy is, is really built in now to the modern policymakers' uh, toolkit. And you especially saw this after 2008, um, when people became kind of Keynesian for about 15 months. Um, and you know, to a certain extent, got the American economy out of the doldrums. Okay, that's grand, but what if the con economy's broke? Well, you could print more money if you cap your own printing press. That'll contribute to inflation. Is that a big deal? Well, you know, not really. Not if it's pretty low already, and especially not if you're at the zero lower bound of your interest rate, where you're not going to have hyperinflation. And as a matter of fact, fiscal policy is going to become more effective, um, as I think was shown in a, in a much later lecture. Um, so what happens if we can't print money? Well, then you get a debt crisis if no one's going to lend to you. Um, that's exactly what Ireland uh, is experiencing, and it implies a fiscal consolidation. The question that you have to ask yourself if you're Michael Noonan, our, our Minister for Finance, or Enda Kenny, our Prime Minister, is how? How do you do this? Well, um, so the government has... Uh, 
a set of fiscal consolidation measures. And you can see the pink line is showing you the uh, spending as a percentage of GDP and the uh, green bar is showing you the revenue uh, drop as a percentage of GDP. And you can see really that most of the spending, most of the cuts and the austerity really are coming on spending. So uh, drop 2.9, 2.6, 1.4. And you can see it's been more or less balanced. Two thirds expenditure, one third, um, one third revenue, which is increasing taxes. You can also see that the structural primary balance, which is the, uh, um, when you take account, when you strip out the cyclical effects, this is the difference between government expenditure and uh, uh, taxation revenue, stripping out the fact, stripping out some of the cyclical elements and without taking account of the um, cost of paying off the national debt. And you can see that it's been dropping quite rapidly. So we have been getting our house in order, I suppose is the point. Um, there's a big deal about the public sector pay debate. And the, the, the big deal really, it, it, it's this, that, that the public sector in some sense mediates between aspects of the private sector. Um, and and it, it, is a, it is an important part of the economy. First and foremost, it's one of the largest parts of the economy. Um, it's one of the largest employers with 330,000 workers. They're some of the best paid workers. They're also, they enjoy um, um, lots of privilege. They also work very hard and they contribute to the furtherment of society. They make things better. Um, and so it's, it's difficult. However, public sector pay is very expensive. It's 14 billion euros a year. It's 9% of GDP. It's much more expensive in terms of GNP uh, than, than almost anywhere else. Here you've got Ireland and Portugal. And in terms of GDP, it's, you know, in the middle there. Um, so, so overall, you can say, you know, pretty conclusively that public sector pay is something that needs to be looked at, especially in the context of pay pensions uh, and everything else. OK. Um, cuts. Well, OK, this is a big deal. What should you cut? If you have to cut something, should you cut social welfare rates? Should you cut um, public sector pay? Should you cut job seekers allowance, disability allowances? Who knows? One thing that's for certain is that child benefit over the boom exploded, really, really increased. And again, up until 2008, it, it, it increased massively. And so, so that's a, a big deal. It also increased much higher than the um, rate of inflation. It's measured by the CPI, which is this sort of pink line here. Um, it's true that the public sector pay bill has increased um, something like 120%, um, while the wage has increased by 61%. And overall, um, you can see that the public sector is bloated in how much it spends, but also how much it pays its workers. So the other interesting thing is that it's getting a lot easier to fund the state. And um, we've just, uh, uh, introduction, we've just uh, uh, maybe done a debt deal on our debt at the end of June. It's all up in the air still. Um, we've had a success, two successful, one successful bill and one successful bond auction, about five year maturity, roughly 6%. Uh, uh, spread not too bad um, debt rollovers uh, which which push the debt that's due in 2014 into 2017 uh, lessen the likelihood of a fiscal cliff which is the a government needing to borrow a massive amount to get back to um, um, balance and so so we see here that this line this is measuring Ireland's government bonds at maturity in billions of euros as you can see at the end of 2014, right now we owe like 8 billion euros. So what we'd really like to do is maybe push that into 2015 or 2017. Um, the yields on our, Ireland's bonds are going down, down, down. These are just the 10-year bonds. Well, not really. There's Oh, this, this is uh, two-year bonds, not 10-year bonds. You can see it's going down rather rapidly, which is very good. And um, another interesting fact um, is that there's a trade-off. If you want to pay down your debt, um, you have to pay. You have to raise your repayment rate high enough to cover the charges you incur while you're paying off that debt. In other words, you need to grow. So this is a model I quite like. It says that uh, debt as a percentage of output at time t is just one plus r, which is the interest rate, minus g, which is the growth rate. So if if, if the interest rate was three percent and you grew at one percent, you know th this thing is going to be. Is going to be different than if this is three percent. This is five. Okay. Um, what it means is if you're growing faster than your um, rate of um, interest, it means you can pay down your debt at any amount because this is always going to be shrinking. So if you can get the economy to grow, and that's what this little derivation is saying, if you can get the economy to grow, 
then you're going to be in reasonable shape at all times, actually. You'll always be in good shape. If G is greater than R, the growth rate of your economy is greater than the uh, real interest rate, you're in happy days. If it's less, and let's face it, it is less, we're supposed to grow at 1% and um, for the next couple of years, and the real interest rate is 6 so we have a problem. The debt dynamics are against us. Looking at the... Oh, right, Excel example. Uh, looking at the um, looking at the, the the economics of a depression, if you have um, y is equal to c plus i plus g plus net a, net exports, you allow the consumption function to take this form, slot the consumption function into that, and you get that one minus the consumption function c y, which is basically the multiplier, um, times uh, equilibrium output is just c zero plus i plus g plus n x. The government purchases go up so g goes up and g rises then investment spending i or net exports are going to go down actually in this world which is pretty mental and what you see really what you see really um is that in the economics of a depression things are made topsy-turvy and i'm gonna address that in the next uh, lecture